Anyway, how is this going to protect our end terminus? Um, it will protect the end do like an additional elimination and right. then make it an amide bond so that that's right. basically okay so first the nitrogen will attack whoops this should have been a carbon the nitrogen will attack this carbon and then we're going to reform the carbonyl this is obviously very reactive because it's an acyl halide So I didn't show all the steps because we've seen that additional elimination reaction many times. First, the nitrogen is going to attack the carbonyl. Uh, then we're going to reform the carbonyl. Who's the leaving group that's going to leave? Yeah. That's the chlorine. So this leaving group will leave, and then we'll be left with this. The nitrogen has to lose a proton after it attacks. So now we will get this. Now, why do we say that this nitrogen is protected? What, it's still here, after all. Because now, it's not nucleophilic anymore. Why is it not nucleophilic anymore? Because it has a resonance with a plus charge. That's right. It's like, it was really an amide nitrogen now. We've turned it into an amide. We know there's a resonance structure where it has a positive charge. So putting it next to a carbonyl has made it an amide, and now it's not nucleophilic. So we don't, we don't need to worry now that this N-terminus will go around and attack anybody. You can see the reason why uh, instructors like going over peptides and amino acids at the end of the course is because it's just an illustration of all the carboxylic acid derivative reactions you saw earlier. What they want you to do is just use the carboxylic acid derivative reactions you saw earlier to analyze these more complicated molecules. That's what really makes organic chemists happy when they can take very complicated molecules and use relatively simple reaction ideas to explain them. These seem very complicated, but we're just using our basic addition elimination reactions from carboxylic acid derivatives. Now, for short, for short, to show that this was protected, we could just write CBZ to show it's protected. Or even for shorter, we could write it like this. It's glycine with a CBZ on the N-terminus to show that we protected that N-terminus. Okay. So now we know that only this nitrogen is going to act like the uh, nucleophile because we're not protecting the alanine. So obviously when we add the carboxybenzene, we only want to add that to the glycine. We wouldn't want to add that to the alanine. So now this really will be the only nucleophile around. But now we have another problem. We have to protect this carboxy group so this doesn't get attacked. After all, one alanine, there's more than one alanine in the mix. So if we're not careful, we could get one alanine attacking another alanine, and then we would get ala ala, which is not what we want. So we also need to protect the carboxy group here. Oh, no, I guess we're not quite ready for this yet. Let's, uh, let's stick with the amino protecting groups for a bit. So there's another amino protecting group, which is the BOC. You went over that too, BOC? Yes. All right, well, let's finish with the amino protecting groups while we're at it. Okay. So another group is. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if there's any reason why you would prefer the, the box to the CBZ. They're just two different options. Oh, okay. uh, if, if your instructor mentioned the reason, that's fine, but there's no, uh, they don't see in the textbook why one is better than the other, at least not so far. So BOC here stands for butoxycarbonyl. Although we're not ready for that yet. 
this isn't the bot yet. So we start with this uh, protecting group. So uh, what do we got here? Oh, We've got a chirp that, beetle is that group. Is that turns into block? Is it? Uh, let's yeah. see. So this is called, yeah, bis 11-dimethyl dicarbonate. So um, anyway, we start with this. So we got a chirp beetle group, an oxygen, a carbonyl, an oxygen, a carbonyl, an oxygen, and another chirp beetle group. So it's a pretty complicated looking molecule. Now we would still expect the nitrogen to attack this nucleophilically. And who's the nitrogen going to attack? Um. It'll attack the carbonyl carbon. We know that carbonyl carbons are good electrophiles. And again, we're going to do an addition elimination. Who's going to be the L group? The, oh, that whole, oh. This oxygen, not this oxygen. Why is this top oxygen a better leaving group? Because it can be resonance stabilized. Right. There's resonance stabilization. If this oxygen leaves, it'll be resonance stabilized because it's next to this carbonyl. Whereas if this oxygen left, it would have no resonance stabilization. So this whole group up here is going to be our L group. Up here, what are we going to end up attached to? We're all going to end up attached to a carbonyl and then a chert hydroxy group over here. This whole group here has left, so that's gone. And again, why is this nitrogen protected? Why is it not a nucleophile anymore? Because it's stabilized through resonance. Yeah, there's a resonance structure where there's a positive charge. Again, basically, we turn it into a kind of an amide. It's kind of an amide nitrogen again, so we know those are not nucleophilic. Now, this is what we would call the Bach group over here. This is Bach, which stands for Bute Oxy Carbonyl. So it's called Bach after it's attached. You can see this is a butyl group here because there's four carbons, one, two, three, and four. Technically, it should be Chert Bute Oxy Carbonyl, but they leave the T out in the abbreviation. I guess it would be more accurate to call it T Bach. T Bach, but people just usually say Bach. So for short, we could just write this like this. We could say we have a glycine with the chert butoxy carbonyl attached to its end terminus. All right, and I don't really know um, why would someone would prefer um, the Bach protecting group to the previous one. Um, either of them seems fine. Oh. So well, I, should, I forgot to say something very important. I forgot to say how do you get rid of the protecting groups when you don't need them anymore. Uh, so that just has to be memorized. So the CBZ is deprotected by um, hydrogenation, H2 and unpalladium. So we should have done that when we did the CBZ earlier. That was the, carbo the carbobenzoxy, carbobenzoxy, the CBZ. That would be deprotected with So this will break the, uh, the protecting group off. And how do we get rid of the Bach? Uh, that is done with uh, acid under mild conditions. If you want to deprotect this, you do basically a hydrogenation. In this context, this is called a hydrogenolysis. This is called hydrogenolysis, but it's like a hydrogenation. And with the Bach, we would get rid of that uh, uh, under mild acid. So that just has to be memorized. So that gives you a reason to prefer one of these to the other. For example, if for some reason you wanted to avoid ever using acid, you would want to use the CBZ. Or if for some reason you wanted to avoid doing hydrogenations, you could use the Bach. If there were some other functional groups that were sensitive to one of these deprotecting strategies, then that would influence which protecting group you put on in the first place. Of course, in real life, you wouldn't deprotect it until you'd already made the peptide. Yeah. Uh, until you made the dipeptide. 
So now we've seen how to attach these groups and also how to remove them. And we saw that the way that you attach them should make good sense because it's just nucleophilic attack on carboxylic acid derivatives. It's our standard addition elimination reaction. 